my path was very linear. It wasn't like, you know, be an entrepreneur, create a lemon lemonade stand, learn how to, you know, hustle at a young age. <laughs> it was definitely just pound schoolwork, just school, 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 grades, 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 sit at the front of the classroom and be a be a teacher's pet. And at the same time, you know, I came from a family that was very traditional. That's Eva Sade, a CEO, entrepreneur, founder, and a Forbes 30 Under 30 recipient. She's a featured career mashupper in my new book, Building the Business of You, a system to align passion and growth potential through your own career mashup. While her journey started out following the traditional linear path towards career growth and progression, she chose to take a detour. She parallel pathed her way towards entrepreneurship and subsequently defined a career that could leverage all of her talents and interests, all while hedging against risk, being fluid, and still taking a systematic approach. And she learned throughout her experiences that she was a business and brand herself. It's clear to say it sits down. I am a brand. You are a brand, Connie. We're all brands of of ourselves and we're all our, our own startups. I mean, we have needs. We have a back office of, of a support system. We have the money we produce. We've got our daily procedures, like wake up, brush your teeth, make your bed. Like So so I think a person in a startup is not fundamentally different and people need to restart the same way as businesses do. So how did Eva create that career mashup that enabled her to align passions, goals, and interests to get her to where she is today. Welcome to Strategic Momentum, the pod course with actionable tips, inspiring stories, and practical advice from progressive leaders on what it takes to break through business and career inertia and understand the business of work. I'm your host, Connie Steele. Fluidity may seem like a state of being that is innate to every worker in the millennial generation, but the reality is that it is something that can be achieved by anyone, even if it has to be worked towards. And in this new world of work, traditional paradigms have fundamentally changed. The model of career progression and growth used to be linear. And that's certainly what Flossbar and Medbar founder Eva Sade was conditioned to believe. After she attended the acclaimed Stuyvesant High School in New York, she went on to study pre-med at Harvard and was well on track for what would be considered a traditionally successful career journey. But here, Eva chose to break away and be fluid. Instead of continuing in medicine, she pivoted to finance and went on to work at Bridgewater, one of the top hedge funds in the world. She then forged a parallel path towards starting her own business in an industry where she was a complete outsider. But to understand Eva's journey and learn how we can take a fluid approach while still charting a plan to achieve our goals, let's hear more about her early career choices. I came from Poland to America with my family of six. I was the youngest child, and we lived in Brooklyn, New York, and Bensonhurst, very diverse area of Jewish people, Albanian people, Chinese people, Russian people. It was essentially the definitely a melting pot of New York City. And uh, my path was very linear. It wasn't like, you know, be an entrepreneur, create a lemon lemonade stand, learn how to how to, you know, hustle at a young age. <laughs> it was definitely just pound schoolwork. Just school, 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 grades, 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 sit at the front of the classroom and be a be a teacher's pet. And at the same time, you know, I came from a family that was very traditional. So I was raised to cook and clean and be a housewife. I recently got engaged, but I'm still not a housewife. See, happy ring. Um, Not a housewife. So anyway, I went to Stuyvesant High School. It's a magnet school in downtown New York City and just ran as fast as possible um, on the track team and studied as hard as possible to get into Harvard undergrad. I was pre-med first, and then I saw how much debt my siblings were in, so I didn't want to be in a ton of debt, especially from an immigrant family. So I studied economics, and the reason I did was because I saw everyone else doing it. It seemed it seemed like the thing you do at Harvard and what, what everyone who is aspiring to, you know, be the best of their class was doing, and so... That's what people were doing. And then the best jobs pay-wise were on the buy side versus the sell side. And so I just went, you know, chasing the, the security of it. 
And I went into finance, worked at Bridgewater Associates, and afterwards became an entrepreneur. And it's not like you joined any hedge fund. You joined (laughs) Bridgewater, (laughs) which is very well known. Also, not just because it's a top hedge fund, but specifically it has a unique culture. So what are those key things that you learned that have continued to shape your career while you were at that company? Yeah. I mean, what I liked about Bridgewater specifically was, you know, I went to the career table because I was just walking around all the career tables and fairs and they're, they're recruiting. As once I came back there and, and told my friends about, you know, which tables I went to, we shared contacts and everything. Someone said, people like you go there. And I was like, people like me, what what am I typecast as? And basically they said people who are rather blunt and intelligent. So, so, you know, at the, the time I didn't have that many social graces. So, and people at Bridgewater have social graces to be very, very clear. It's just that the persona of the radical transparency and the constant feedback and everything in everyone's heads fit the kind of person that they saw me being in terms of how I behave in class, in terms of being very direct and how I behaved interpersonally. So that external fit criteria was super interesting to me. And I learned more about the company and at the level of what are what is it trying to achieve? It was a really intellectual place where they're just trying to be the best at both management and investment. And at the same time, it was a, an interesting I would call it a social experiment, an interesting social experiment to to be part of. And half my major was uh, social psychology. So bringing that both those things together was a really interesting place to go. So is it fair to even say early on that you are mashing up various interests and almost natural skills, just elements of who you are to an environment that seemed to be the right fit that leveraged all those things? That's right. I looked at who who am I? What's the environment? And then what can the environment help me grow to be as well? You wouldn't you can't change the core of who I am, but what are some some things I can learn over there? I mean, your first job out of a college is gonna gonna shape you, not just from your professional resume, but but from who you are, because you're still impressionable. I mean, I, I was an early graduate. I was, I think I was 21 when I graduated. So could barely go to the bar during recruiting, which was a little limiting. And so, so what I saw there was not just, okay, it echoed who I am, but also it has a big focus on systemization. How can you make everything a machine? How can you make it a process? How can you make it repeatable? Because it's a hedge fund that's been successful for 40 years plus beating the market very much on average. And so so how can I learn what that means and what the ethos of who I am can translate into that kind of success? This element of systemization, continual improvement, would you say that also was just a natural draw given that you happen to be a championed runner (laughs) in high school? as you had mentioned to me earlier when we had a chance to talk. And so being a high-performing athlete also has elements of that too. I mean, the competitiveness is one thing, but just to be able to continue to strive and build and get better, there is an element of systemization too. Yes. Yeah, so when you're an athlete, your body becomes a system. What you feed it and what you do with it and how, how well you follow your, your coach's advice generates your success. So, so it's very, it's very similar to that. And then afterwards, like once you get to a level of, you know, regular athlete to top ranking athlete, it starts being more psychology because you know, your body can perform. If there were injuries that were at least too, too strenuous, you've learned kind of where the level is, but after a while it's psychological and the same thing with Bridgewater. Like you, you come in and you, you get your fit. You're at a level of a good athlete. And then how do you become an excellent athlete? Well, it's not just your coaches, your people at work, but it's also the time you take for yourself and, and resting and reflecting and journaling to get those things to actually stick. And it's tough, you know, like being, like being an athlete and like being an, I guess, an intellectual athlete. 
at Bridgewater, it's definitely like you, you start out thinking you can do it, thinking that you can do it. And then you reach a pit of despair where you're like, oh no, I learned too much about myself as an intellectual athlete. Oh no, who am I? And then, and then you gradually dig your way out of that to establish who you are and learn from that experience. So it, it makes you tough. Sounds like it. And it also sounds like that it's this continual development, ultimately, of these hard skills, but also the soft skills um, all along the way. So just as an athlete, when you mention it's, you know, it's mental and it's self-reflection, I mean, that does translate also into important soft skills, which are not always very specific. It is the sensing, feeling, and psychology of things to know how to best uh, engage with people, how to lead people, how to steer a team, and so forth, coupled with developing brand new areas of expertise to help you do your job. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I'd say when it's soft skills, what what is the bare bones soft skill? It's not freaking out. Uh, honestly, like if you can just achieve like emotional stability uh, in difficult environments, that's when you can layer on leadership. Because if you don't have that baseline, you're I don't know, you can't read that many books about social psychology if you can't inaction them. So that's just critical. So taking so many punches to the face gets you at a level where, you know, at Bridgewater, you could be a leader, but then externally, you're, you know, you're getting punches to the face, but at least less frequently. And then you're really thriving at that point. Eva was fortunate to find a company right out of school that fit with not only what she was looking for in a work environment, but also who she was as a person, her broader interests, and what she wanted to learn. And although Eva started from the perspective that a traditional linear route was more advantageous to take, her experience at Bridgewater wasn't a straight line. In fact, she explored various roles to find what stuck. And that was all valuable when it came time to start her own entrepreneurial venture. I could weave a story through there of what I learned and where I pivoted, but mostly I just didn't know what I was going to be doing. I was just try, trying things because when you're when you're a young person, you just want to want to learn. And I was there there to really learn. So everything bumped into another thing where I started in tech, but I wasn't that good at coding, but I was reasonable at product management. And there was a cool project and I got to lead that project. And then, you know, the I understood process improvement, but I felt it was career limiting. So I went into investment and, and took the amazing world-class investment program. And after I, I did that, I was just getting itchy being there for four years. So it just, it, it was just a mishmash. It wasn't anything planful, I would say. How do you feel that's helped you? in terms of being able to test and learn your way now as you have developed your, your business? I definitely say the shape shifting is really important, like being able, and when you're at Bridgewater and you change roles, you change departments, you have to do a clean start places. So while I was a kid, that's not like my parents were in the military and I had to a fresh start at school every every couple of years because we moved to a different country. But when you move roles a lot, it's like going into somewhere where you, you don't know everybody. You're roughly familiar with how society operates over there, but you're put at different projects and you know where you succeeded and failed. It's almost like you were a startup in each of those roles. And then you found out what you do well and poorly, found a new opportunity and then need to need to establish it. So, I mean, my business is a frequent pivoter to, to say the least. Almost sounds like you recognize early on that by, these ha- by having these different pivots, you were the business of you itself. And it was always a work mm-hmm. in progress and defining what those goals are to get you where you wanted to go. Yeah, I mean, as clear as you it's it sounds, I am a brand. You are a brand, Connie. We're all brands of of ourselves and we're all our, our own startups. I mean, we have needs. We have a back office of, of a support system. We have the, the money we produce. We, you know, we've got our daily procedures, like wake up, brush your teeth, make your bed. Like, so, so I think a person in a startup is not fundamentally different and people need to restart the same way as businesses do. 
So let's transition and talk about how you decided to transition into entrepreneurship after being at Bridgewater. Yeah. So it first comes with inspiration. So I was really inspired by my partner's startup. He was a banker and he did a part-time startup just in his own time that I watched him do from, from what's the phrase, soup to nuts or something. I watched, I don't know these American Indians. He had an idea, which is a whiskey subscription startup because there are too many wine subscription startups. And, and in, in Asia, everyone was liking the, the other liquors and you know whatnot. It made some basic business sense to do it. And his roommate was a, a social marketing guru. So they put their heads together, Stuart as a scotch expert and Tim as the social, social media guru. And then they created this company called Pour More, like Pour More Liquor. So pourmore.com. And we're able to spin that up relatively quickly, use a lot of creative things where they didn't actually have to do stuff. They were like a layer above the existing industry. And they ran it in a lit- literally a very lightweight, lightweight way, part time with their time, and then they were able to sell it at a reasonable seven figure price to a private equity group. And it just it just blew me away. It's like, what are these people doing? I've never even sold lemonade. Like I've never sold anything, but somebody buying my time to do a thing. Like there was never like a product that, especially not coffee that that I sold. And I just saw them sell something. And I was, you know, I was minorly jealous. I wanted to do it as well. I, I saw and I learned what they did. And and I can be agile like that. And so when I was getting that kind of uh, four-year itch at Bridgewater, I was there for a while. What I decided to do was uh, twofold. One is write down all of the startup ideas I can think of from absurd to good and, and you know, anything in between, things that twists on existing business models. I had about a list of 20 of them and, and various research I did. And so I call that structured creativity. It wasn't a light bulb. The light bulb was the passion when I felt unjust that I couldn't do it too and I haven't done it yet. So that like element of competitiveness, but it was basically like a structured list of everything I can think of. And I was inspired by Dry Bar. It's the women's hair care brand. And it had a great brand. It took the simple part of an industry and it did that thing well. And so how can I apply that concept? What industry is ripe for that? Well, it was uh, dental services. And so whenever I talked to anyone about, you know, my various 20 startup ideas, that one really popped for people. It was getting that validation that they understood the problem. It was simple enough. It was a clear need and they liked the approach. So that was step one, find your idea. And step two, okay, now you have to shift your life to be an entrepreneur, right? (laughs) It's not about the idea. It's about the execution. And so what I did is I hedged risk. I went to business school at the same time as pivoting my life to be an entrepreneur because I was a first-time entrepreneur. So I wanted a cover story in case it didn't work out. So I went in, went to Wharton Business School for one semester while doing a bunch of pilots in the area and, and learning and talking to people. And then as the business had a clear proof of concept, I then left business school to join it full-time. Unpacking all that, which is pretty amazing. Sounds like first, you got exposed to how many people are having side hustles right now and seeing that there's not a singular focus on any any one career necessarily, that mm-hmm. there are opportunities to be able to pursue multiple different paths of which maybe the the job that you have now is your primary but yet you have this side hustle, which could become a primary or could become, it's, it's something you're very passionate about, which could fulfill another side of you. And so that exposure to it led you to making this pivot and wanting to pursue that path. And then applying my guess, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but everything that you learned having been a product manager learning what it takes to build products. Since you applied agile development, you talked about pivoting, you talked about testing and learning. Mm -hmm. Those are core principles. You apply that to starting your business from this 
idea that you had by identifying those trends, spotting those trends, and realizing this is where I want to go? You are so concise, Connie. You've said it so, so (laughs) elegantly. Thank you. Yes, that is what I was trying to say. As Eva shared, the ability to shape shift was an important skill she learned at Bridgewater. And this fluid mindset and approach was invaluable when she decided to take that path towards entrepreneurship. Plus, she knew what it took to build a successful side hustle and saw the fulfillment it could bring as she watched her partner's startup grow. This experience inspired her to try this route for herself once she identified the market opportunity to fill. Soon, she began taking systematic steps to making her new dream a reality. This structured creativity sets her apart from other entrepreneurs. While many have a eureka moment and hope to keep the idea to themselves, Eva's methodical approach to brainstorming involved identifying trends, making lists of ideas, and then soliciting feedback on her potential ventures. So it first started with talking, frankly. A lot of entrepreneurs, when they have an idea, think of ways to make sure that they're not telling anyone about it. That approach is not one I took. I just kept babbling and babbling and babbling about it. And because I knew I can beat competitors to the market with this, I knew I had the passion and, and I figured out roughly how to do it and, and all of that. And if there's a copycat, I analyze the market that the market's big enough to handle, you know, all 10 of us. So that, that was, you know, how, how I really kicked it off. And the, the resources I put together were actually family. Like I grabbed my sister to come do it with me. You know, I had some, interestingly, I've been through a lot of co-founders and none of them fit well with me. I've learned that, you know, on myself, I, I like to be the founder. I love having advisors and then I love having employees and I love having my family help because I know they're, they're ride or die uh, type people. I'm not good at management peers for some reason. It makes me nervous. I get stressed. I don't like equals. And, and you know, I don't think it's because I'm not humble. It's just like, I don't know. I just freak out by not having the level of authority I would want to and needing to, to agree when I'm more of a trailblazer. So I put together basically those resources to kick it off. So what's interesting to me is that at the end of the day, you don't have a background in dentistry or the dental field. Mm -hmm. You're a complete outsider, which I'm sure led to various roadblocks along the way. So tell us about those challenges that you faced in gaining traction that you were looking for. Yes, yes, that's a great question because I think it's going to it's going to help this answer is going to really help people. So, I was an industry outsider, which means people didn't trust me. And given I was trying to do something in the industry and disrupt hard. the industry, I would say a key thing is you're coming in to disrupt it. I don't know, they don't like that word, so I've actually kicked it out of my vocabulary. But that's the truth, right? So you've learned not to necessarily use the word, but in reality you're changing the game. Yes, I learned it. And I learned actually what what language to use to make them comfortable with the disruption. So yes, I disrupted the industry. Okay, I'll admit it. And so one way I was able to do that was to just, again, that calmness. So a lot of dentistry and thought leaders operate on forums. So there are dental forums and a lot of people are throwing beer cans. There's like, who's this crazy millennial that created Jiffy Lube for your face? Like, what is she doing? Low quality of care, not thought out, illegal, like anything they can throw throw at it when like, clearly I did the legal research. And so that kind of thing of like responding really calmly to criticism and not getting into a fist fight was really important because then the people on the sidelines, the ones who aren't responding in the forum, but are just watching it, then they privately message you and then they want to talk to you. So even though on the front you're getting hit, they see you're not wavering. And then they want to talk to you. So, so getting those the quiet people to cut to come around and direct message you is important. And then the second thing is borrowed credibility. And this is a concept that that some people do naturally, but I've finally labeled it. It's basically if you're not the expert, 
in something and you're going into some kind of meeting or talk or or any real interaction with the industry, investors especially, right? I'm an outsider. I needed investment money. And I would actually just take someone who is credible with me pre-game that they are supposed to basically be state their credibility at the beginning. And then where there are questions they know I know the answer to, to defer them to me. And so they'd constantly be throwing it at me, even though they're the expert, which then created that social proof that I'm in fact an expert as well. So I would take someone credible, usually a male, because that's just a reality as well, and have them state their credibility at the beginning, but pregame with them that for questions that they know that I know the answer to and have a threshold of understanding, they would kick it back to me. So then they, them deferring to me would then create that social proof that, that would enable me to then answer those questions and establish my own credibility. So that was a psychological principle I put together from learnings in social psychology and the grappling with just reality that Bridgewater kicks into you. Eva's decision to parallel track her entrepreneurial venture while also attending business school enabled her to hedge against risk. Further, the skills she gained during her time at Bridgewater helped her build the mental fortitude needed to take on challenging situations she faced. And that was even before she realized this was the route she wanted to take. Once Eva identified her goals, she established a plan to break into and disrupt an industry where she was an outsider. Based on the knowledge she gained through her psychology studies in college, coupled with the insights and training from her experience at the hedge fund, she developed a concept called borrowed credibility that helped her break through and gain traction. Yet Eva also knew the importance of having that village of support to help her through this journey to build and grow her business. Well, a lot of good things I did was have mentors. So because it's like knowing what you don't know, I didn't know what I needed because I'd never been an entrepreneur. And by watching under other entrepreneurs and learning their stories, I was able to learn those things. And for me, like I... I live with an entrepreneur, right? I was inspired by Stuart's uh, liquor startup, interestingly, from from liquor to to help. And so always having him be able to be involved in everything, it was like, you know, I know everyone talks about the the woman behind the man, you know, these days and in popular stories, but sometimes it's the man behind the woman. Like he is just an avid supporter of me. And so constantly having him who's more advanced in that specific topic be be a coach and a mentor on that business side, it helped me understand what I need. So what did I need, right? I needed a team around me. I needed an HR department so the team doesn't sue me. I needed I needed a good legal group to, to be able to do stuff in healthcare that is regulated. I needed some investors so I wouldn't keep having my credit cards maxed out. I needed to make a pitch deck, right? I, I understood what a pitch deck was from school, but not a real pitch deck and how to make it. And I needed to raise that capital, how much to raise, how to even structure that. You know, having that person on tap was really important to me. And there's a lot of people who who want to mentor startups. There's even programs at major banks where, where people who are working at major banks, they've got a little bit of that entrepreneurial risk. They're not going to leave, but they highly want to be mentors to young entrepreneurs. So places like Morgan Stanley and UBS have excellent mentors for people. I was just lucky because my mentor was at home. Well, there was another term that we had talked about, by the way, and you called it contentless management. So share share that a bit more, which does tie to what you said, but I just thought it was so great that you had branded it, I guess, or kind of <laughs> used that term in that particular context. That's a good thing to come out of Bridgewater. And they use that term very much, which is if you're not an expert in something, how do you manage it? Well, you're not going to be able to call BS on people because you don't know what they're talking about. So you need a threshold level of understanding. So, okay, understand the topic 70% to be able to manage people doing stuff in it. Like that's your threshold of understanding. But when it comes to the details and the plans and your most important decisions, 
what you could do is really pit the experts against each other. And so if you, rather than having one expert you depend on that's perhaps overly proud of their expertise and isn't going to unravel and ask those questions, have the other expert in them have a conversation in front of you and try to break it down. That way you're getting multiple viewpoints and not trapped with your existing expert. So what I did was I, you know, put together, if a dentist was saying, no, mobile dentistry isn't legal because you can't have a hygienist work alone. I was like, I know the legal guy says he says you can. And then so you stick them both in the room and say, okay, you say we can, you say we can't talk it out. And then you learn from there. So that enables you to act on the manager level while at the same time, not being irresponsible and able to be swayed by someone who could be an expert that maybe has something to learn. So you're really facilitating dialogue of different perspectives so that at the end of the day, you're able to truly see a comprehensive view of all the dynamics, which then I would assume would help you plan effectively and then understand the different potentially chess moves that if you were to move towards one direction, you know what the implications could be. If you decide to shift in another direction, you've got an understanding of what those implications be. But it's been a data gathering exercise to understand how to ultimately hedge against risk. That's right. That's right. What were the things? Contentless management, borrowed credibility. And then I think the third is just raise capital so you can fund all this activity. Um, I think we're just all really important things. And so how much of an inhibitor was fear in this whole process of bringing your business to life? And how did you deal with it? Let's see, fear. I think I just got past fear. And how did you get past fear? I already went through the hump of realizing I'm taking a risky path in life. And so once I grappled with that decision, and I basically went to the level of spending all my savings on starting a company, it was almost like I had nothing to lose. (laughs) So like, what am I afraid of? Exactly. Like once you take that leap, you're more likely to take other leaps. So for me, it wasn't really fear of being an entrepreneur and and fear, fear of failure. It could be at times fear of embarrassment though. Like I, I know if like I was embarrassed about something, I'd feel bad. So it's that threat. It's that like human response, like what on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, what do we need? We need at the bottom security, being able to sustain yourself, eating. All right, I got that at least. I know that I've got that. And if I don't have that, at least I have some kind of social safety net. But the next level is belonging. And so it was super key to me to feel like I belong in the dental community and that I'm not overly disruptive, even though I am, but people respect my view and people like me. That kind of like social aspect was something something that I was afraid of. And if anything, I was taking that made my heart beat. It's those kinds of chances to, to get out there. For many today, there is a desire and even a need to have optionality and flexibility versus being singular, focused, and limited. For Eva, that was vital as she knew she couldn't always control the uncontrollable. When it came to business, and in life. So optionality is important because things don't always go your way. There's variables you can control and then there's variables you can't control. So having some options from different business strategies you can employ, different even hedges in life, like go to business school while you start a startup, is just really important to remain calm, frankly. And, and, you know, as I said earlier in the, in the podcast, the remaining calm is the first like stepping stone of leadership because you can't apply theory if you're panicking. And so for me, creating options like makes me more calm because I know I can switch to a different thing if one thing doesn't, doesn't work out. And I've applied that principle by going from med bar or floss bar to med bar, having the the optionality there, a few other crazy secret things that we're going to do soon. And also, so in life with the hedge of business school versus not business school and doing a startup, and then also an early career. So going, you know, as pre-med 
at first, but didn't want to be in debt. So how did I end up in medicine with that, that kind of view of wanting to create healthcare outcomes? Well, I just did it in a different way than medical school, different ways to start a business or be involved on the business side of, of medical. So finding those alternate paths such that you don't feel stuck is very emotionally rewarding. Is this notion of finding multiple paths so you don't get stuck something that was always innate to you, even when you were young, before going into college and especially before going into Bridgewater? Or it's something that you learned once you're at Bridgewater and then also then applied to obviously your endeavors going forward? I think for me, it was innate because it's how I saw my parents operate when we got to this country. So they each had multiple jobs. We made sure to have my dad be the super of the building so we don't have rent and then have another job and and the, always trying to get those multiple streams of income. And, you know, same thing for me in terms of in high school when I wanted to get into Harvard so I'd get a scholarship and not have to pay. It was you know, the hedge of run as fast as possible, run that mile, like, like, you know, got fire behind you and study really hard at the same time. And let's see which one pans out. But, you know, both of those were strategies. I don't think I ever pigeonhole myself into doing one thing now that I think about it. By being fluid and mashing up her experiences, skills, past roles, and passions, Eva was able to create Flossbar, a mobile dental service that brings healthcare directly to companies and their employees. Unsurprisingly, she was also able to dynamically pivot and evolve her company during the pandemic, creating a new business line with COVID-19 testing. As such, Medbar was born. So Floss Bar is a, and the, the corporation is called Floss Bar. Med Bar is one of the subsidiaries that's evolved due to recent circumstances. So Floss Bar is a tech-enabled healthcare logistics company. So it's basically taking the clinicians in an area like New York, Arizona, California, wherever, and enabling them to go service their local corporations. So get out of your four walls. Go to an employer site because 66% of employers want care on site. That's a major statistic that is barely penetrated. And so enable those partnerships between the two such that care can actually happen. In order to do that, you need a very robust back office. You need a ton of lift and shift and equipment. You need marketing. You need sales. You need all this stuff. So what our back end fosters is for that transaction to be able to happen such that the clinical people can do the clinical stuff and we can do all the other stuff that they're not specifically tailored for. You've been able to effectively bridge the gap between those service providers and where you start off was dental care, because you saw a huge gap there mm -hmm. and be able to provide convenient services for folks at their office or in other locations where it makes it easier for them to get it. Because I know you mentioned you had, there, there were limitations for people being able to take care of their dental health, which is so core to their overall health in a more efficient way. That's right. For the clinician, it's that opportunity to get patients and fill their time and maybe drive them back to, to their local office for advanced treatments. And for, for the patients, it's definitely a convenience play. Like they're at work, they need to get their services done. They may involve taking time off from work. They may not even trust the providers that they, that they have or are in their area. And the employers are, can develop those perks programs for them. So it's win-win on both the sides of the market. So, of course, one of the major challenges that all businesses have been faced with is COVID. And I know in your case, your revenue went or completely fell to zero when COVID happened. You were first primarily focused on the dental service side of things. So what did you do to successfully pivot, which has established the business you have now? Oh yeah. COVID was painful at the beginning. It was like the worst industry to possibly be in because it's uh, you're trying to go to workplaces. 
workplaces are closed and you're doing dental services, which have a major respiratory interaction component. And so all of my clients, they're dropping like flies into, luckily they, they're on contracts so that they, they're going to have services later, but they all have those, those darn force majeure clauses, which means if it's an act of God or government, they, they can't have dental services. So it's almost like that little term in the contract was quite painful, but everyone understands that, you know, you're not going to have dental services at the workplace. So it was really bad. And we were in the middle of a fundraise as well. So pretend, you know, fundraising during COVID with no revenue, that's horrible. You're going to tank. You are going to tank. So we had to do something quickly. And what we came up with was a concept called MedBar, Lost Bar's sister company. And where what we did there was really get on top of COVID-19 testing very quickly. We researched about 60 different supply lines of tests. So even if something was low, we'll, we will find it. We will scour the earth for COVID tests, got all the, the permits and lab licenses and, and all those things that you need to stand it up and basically stood up a new, new business line, heard what the market needed and, and took that nimble team and the resources we had and pivoted them to this. And it wasn't that hard. We're doing healthcare logistics before, okay, for dental. Now we're doing healthcare logistics for medical. It's a, it's a similar process, even though a different service line. And you did it in pretty record time, <laughs> right? I think you had mentioned that this pivot that you made because you had the foundation already there enabled you to be one of the first to market to deliver COVID testing to people in New York. That's right. And not just to New York, like our biggest markets for this are Massachusetts, Texas, Atlanta, Connecticut. So, so we go around because the demand is, you know, everyone's calling for COVID testing. It's one of the most in-demand services right now. And we did it fast because our revenue, our revenue plummeted. So it was either apply someone to a new project, all of, all of everyone, or shut the doors for a while. And so it's just out of necessity, we pivoted really quickly and we were set up with a recruiting arm, a billing team, supply depots, supplier relationships, technology of patient experience. So, so it's it's just figuring out who you fundamentally are, which is a healthcare logistics company, abstract away your service that isn't selling and then sell something else temporarily. What's incredible is that it, it immediately opened up essentially a line extension for you guys, because I know you'll still mm-hmm. offer dental services, which is where you started. You started small or you could say, you know, it's the whole testing and learning product development, start small, Mm -hmm. go with that MVP, you got traction and then you pivoted. But now you've been able to expand your business such that it it will capture uh, a larger share of services and offerings to help people. That's right. And and knowing we we could pivot, there's a lot of ideas we can try. Like I always have the business doing 90% the hum of the things we do and 10% just pure R&D. You know, half a 10% is like, you know, half a weekday or something like that on just innovation and brainstorming so that we can be abreast of what what is new and what we're sensing from the market. Because it's a lot can go on our platform of all the resources we have. So, so even today, Connie, we were brainstorming some top secret plans over there on that, on that whiteboard. So there's there's a lot a lot coming. Sounds like you've been testing and learning uh, your whole life and parallel pathing as well. Yes, yes, I I hedge risk. I see risk from afar and try to get ahead of it. Because my my reality is that risks manifest. I'm just going to assume that and not be afraid of them. I'm just going to hedge them. So if this never worked out, I would have just stayed in business school. It never happened. Padded that risk. But now I just padded the risk of dental going south with medical. And if COVID testing goes away, I'm p- padding it with those other secret plans. And so, so you just have to be a step ahead of what the market's going to buy. To close, what advice would you tell others who are trying to find the right path for them? I would say if you're young, just do it. People love like entrepreneurial stories. I mean, a lot of people are like afraid to get off their career track and do something else. I think that I think like 
your, your chances now, unless you literally have kids at home that you need to feed with your salary, like the older you get, the less likely you're going to be an entrepreneur. And it's amazing when people in, in their, in their forties and fifties and sixties become entrepreneurs, but it's much less likely. So for me, I was, you know, on a track where, where I had saved, you know, by age 26, I had saved a quarter million dollars in my bank account from working and saving. And I was faced with a choice. Like, do I then, okay, put that in my 401k, have it best, keep getting raises, et cetera. Or am I just going to blow it all in a startup and see, see what happens? I mean, once you take that leap, you took that leap and you're going to be proud of yourself for, for the rest of your life. So I'd, I'd highly recommend some risk tolerance people just take <laughs> some risks. And finally, what's the best way listeners can connect with you? Sure. So my email is eva at flossbar.com. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing this incredible story of being able to <laughs> create this amazing business. But one of the core things is how do you hedge against risk? Even being that outsider and creating this optionality to create momentum and impact. What I love about Eva's story is that she's always applied a systematic and strategic approach to achieving her goals while at the same time staying fluid. By constantly trying new things, learning from these situations and leveraging all of her past skills and experiences to these new environments, she was able to build traction and get to where she is today. She has in essence created her own career mashup which has enabled her to achieve a level of impact and fulfillment that she wouldn't have attained by taking a linearly focused path. And Eva recognizes that she is a brand and as such, understands that she has to manage her own life like a business in the same way she manages her company. This is an important lesson for any listeners out there. As with building a company, you have to take some risk and prepare for that change because that's the way you will learn if that route will help you reach your own growth potential. Thanks for listening to Strategic Momentum. To connect with Eva, you can email her at eva at flossbar.com. That's E-V-A at F-L-O-S-S-B-A-R.com. To understand more about the future of work, what it means for careers, and most importantly, what to do about it to create your unique career mashup like Eva's, go to bizofyou.co to learn more about my new book, Building the Business of You. In the book, you'll learn how to employ a dynamic strategic planning process to help you be the CEO of you, while also discovering the compelling stories of other career mashuppers like Eva that will inspire you towards action. The book is available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. If you like what you heard on the podcast, please subscribe to the show and share this episode with friends and colleagues. And of course, we always appreciate ratings and reviews. You can also get show notes, links, and more tips and advice from this episode at strategicmomentum.co. I'm Connie Steele, and you've been listening to the Strategic Momentum Podcast.